Hi everyone, welcome back. In this video we're going to examine how to deal with a position versus time graph that has curves. And this will kind of extend our previous discussion where we were dealing with position versus time graphs that were straight lines, or at least had segments that were straight lines. And from there we had come to the realization that the slope of a position versus time graph is equal to the velocity. Well, the velocity if you have a velocity versus time graph, the slope of that is acceleration. But what can you tell about acceleration from a position versus time graph? That's what we're going to examine here. So recalling, since velocity is the rate at which position changes, that's why the slope of a position versus time graph gives you the velocity. And if after doing that you're able to generate a full velocity versus time graph, the slope of that will be acceleration, because after all, acceleration is the rate at which velocity changes. In other words, a is equal to delta v over delta t, just as v is equal to delta x over delta t. So now we're going to look at what happens when there is clearly a changing slope in your graph. So let's say we have a graph that has a, a, a curve on it. So the question is, how can we find the instantaneous rate of change? Well, if you know calculus, you know about all this stuff about um, making the change in the horizontal coordinate um, really, really small while you get the change in the vertical coordinate being really, really small. Here, we're not going to be that fancy. All we're going to do is we're going to draw a tangent line to the point. What do we mean by a tangent line? A tangent line is a line that has the same slope as the actual graph at that point and also just barely touches the graph at that point. So in other words, these are not tangent lines. The first two that showed up um, are clearly not examples of having the same slope as the graph at that point. And the third one that shows up, it does have the same slope as the graph where it touches, except it touches at the wrong point. How embarrassing. So to get a tangent line at the point in question at a time of eight seconds, we would want something pretty much like this. This would be a valid tangent line. So now that you have a valid tangent line, how would you figure out the slope of this thing? Well, the same way that you'd figure out the slope of any ordinary line. You pick two points, preferably points that are as far away from each other as possible. In this case, we could have picked kind of the endpoints, but it's not as clear that those actually cross grid lines. But if we had, we would have gotten pretty much the same answer that we're going to get just by picking these points. But in general, it's a better idea to try to pick points that are farther away, like ho hopefully graphs that you'll be given will have um, more easier to identify areas where the graph, or at least where the line itself crosses grid lines that are far apart. But in this case, it, it just didn't work out that way. But in any case, we have two points. So really the preferred method of actually showing your work for something like this would be to say, okay, V is equal to slope equals delta X over delta T. And you would identify the first point as over six seconds up six feet, because each of the vertical uh, segments is worth two, while the horizontal segments are worth one. So over six seconds, up six feet. And the second point would be over seven seconds, up two feet. So you'd realize, okay, you'd have um, two feet minus six feet, which is negative four feet for your rise. And seven seconds minus six seconds equals one second for your run. And you would get negative four feet per second. Or if you're just being a, a bit lazy and showing your work and hoping that you might end up getting all the credit anyway, you might end up just doing something like this, saying, hey, the run is one second and the rise is negative four feet. And then therefore the slope, in other words, the instantaneous rate of change at a time of eight seconds, which is where that tangent line applies to the graph, that tangent line from which we stole these two points, so we say that at a time of 8 seconds, the velocity is negative 4 feet per second. Because, yeah, the instantaneous rate of change of a position versus time graph, also known as the slope at that point, is the velocity at that point. We call it the instantaneous velocity. So now that we have figured that out, we can take a look at another example. In this case, 
estimating the velocity at a time of four hours on this graph, you end up realizing, okay, your rise is negative one half mile per hour. Actually, I shouldn't say the velocity, but the acceleration, because this is a velocity versus time graph. You realize that the tangent line gives you, well, two points that you can identify on your graph. So the first point is at a time of six hours and a velocity of, let's see, that's going to be 23 and a half miles per hour. And the second point is going to be a time of 14 hours and a velocity of, well, 21, 22, 23 miles per hour. So we had a change in velocity of negative one half mile per hour over a time of eight hours. So that means a rise over run, negative one sixteenth or negative 0.0625 miles per hour squared. Those are acceleration units. They're not SI units. SI units for acceleration would be meters per square second, but you can still recognize the fact that you have a distance over two powers of time. Those are acceleration units. So remember, acceleration is the rate at which the velocity is changing. And similarly, a couple more examples here. And the first example, we have um, about 0.3 yards per minute per year. And that should be 0.3, not 0.3 repeating. And in the second example, we have about negative 0.47 paces per second for our slope at that point. In each case, we drew tangent lines, found two points where the tangent line, we could identify it from the grid on the graph, and then use those points to calculate our slope. And you can do the same thing for other examples as well. Now, what to do about curves on a graph? What can we tell about acceleration from a curve on a graph? So let's say you have this position versus time graph in the scenario. So you have a position versus time graph. Well, we could estimate the slope at various points and then um, basically sketch a plot of the slope versus time. What is slope versus time? That's velocity versus time. So at that first point it's a very steep negative slope. In other words big negative. The next point the blue line is a smaller negative. The next point the green line is a smaller negative still. The orange line, even smaller negative. And then at a time of one second, the slope is zero. So a slope of zero, well, in that case, the velocity at that point is zero. So certainly that point is one we can easily plot right there. And then after that, the slope becomes more positive. And then or a little positive. And then after that, it continues to become more positive. In other words, the entire time the entire time the slope is increasing. It starts off as big negative, becomes small negative, then zero, then small positive, then big positive. But the whole time from zero to two seconds the slope is increasing. So from that we can basically plot estimations of slopes at those points and then sketch the resulting curve. And notice that the resulting curve is always going up. Well, what is the slope of a, of a velocity versus time graph? It's acceleration. So the fact that your velocity is always increasing from 0 to 2 seconds, in other words, always going up, means that the acceleration, the slope of that, is always positive. Okay. Well, what about from 2 to 3 seconds? Well, in that case, the, the slope of the original position versus time graph is negative, but it's always negative and it's always the same negative, which means that the velocity is a constant value, a constant negative value, but a constant value. So the acceleration here, which is the slope of your velocity graph, will be zero. Same thing from three to four seconds. That's also going to have a zero acceleration, a positive velocity, but a positive constant velocity. So a zero acceleration.
What about from four to five seconds? So in this case, you notice that at the beginning, the slope is pretty close to zero. I mean, maybe it's a little bit negative, so maybe we should have started this a little bit below zero here. But in any case, it becomes more and more negative, such that by the time you hit five seconds, the slope is very, very negative, which means we need to be plotting very, very negative values on our velocity versus time graph. And then from five to six seconds, the slope is not only zero, but it is constantly zero, which means the velocity is constantly zero. And the fact that the velocity is constant at all, whether zero or otherwise, means the acceleration is zero from five to six seconds. What can we discern from this? What kind of general rules can we discern from this? Well, notice that in these areas, we can kind of fit a little bit of a kind of uh, something that a face that these remind us of. So in the area from zero to two seconds, that looks kind of like part of a happy face. In fact, a large part of a happy face. So the idea is that a happy face shows a constantly increasing slope. Well, happiness is positive. There we go. Well, there's the mnemonic. When you have a position versus time graph where the curve looks like it's part of a happy face, that means the acceleration is positive. What about from four to five seconds? Well, that curve is at least, it's like the right half of a sad face. Well, from four to five seconds, that tells us that the acceleration is constantly negative. The velocity, in other words, is always decreasing. If the velocity is always decreasing, that means that the acceleration is negative because every next value of velocity is less than the previous value of velocity. So if you were to find the slope of your velocity versus time graph, it's always going to be negative. So that's part of a sad face. Sad face is negative. So any position versus time graph that is part of a sad face has a negative acceleration. What is the value of those positive or negative accelerations? Well, we don't know. In fact, unless you happen to know the functional form of the original position versus time graph, you can't figure it out. All you can say is that it's either positive or negative based on what I call the happy face, sad face rule. Now, what if I had originally shown you a velocity versus time graph and plotted those slopes to figure out acceleration? Well, what would the happy face, sad face rule mean for a velocity versus time graph? Well, since the slope of a velocity versus time graph is acceleration, using the happy face, sad face rule on a velocity versus time graph would tell you whether the jerk is positive or negative. Remember, jerk is the rate at which acceleration changes. Okay. So there we go. From position to velocity, take the slope. From velocity versus time graph to acceleration, take the slope. From acceleration versus time graph, take the slope to get jerk. Well, you can skip over one by using the happy face, sad face rule. A happy face on a position versus time graph tells you positive acceleration. A sad face on a velocity versus time graph would tell you negative jerk. So hopefully this is clear to everyone. In fact, it would I, would, I would say, behoove you to fill out a table like this on your own. So if you're trying to study for a test while watching this video, now would be a good time to pause this video and fill out, make a table like this, and then fill it out on your own. So we'll pause for a few seconds here, and you should pause the video and fill out the table. So now, hopefully your table looks something like this. If you're trying to get position from a position versus time graph, you read the graph. What does that mean? It means reading the value of the vertical axis at that point in time. So if somebody asks you, what's the position at a time of 8 seconds? Well, you go horizontally to a time of 8 seconds, go up to where your graph is at 8 seconds, and then read off the um, vertical, uh, go, go kind of back to the left where the axis is and read off the vertical the value on the vertical axis and that'll tell you the position. What if you're trying to get velocity from position versus time graph? Well, take the slope. What if you're trying to get acceleration? Well, you can figure out whether it's positive or negative by doing the happy face, sad face rule. And if your position versus time graph is a straight line, the acceleration is always zero. Because think about it. If it's a straight line, that means it's not part of a happy face. So the acceleration is not positive. If it's a straight line, it's not part of a sad face, so the acceleration is not negative. 
So if it's not positive and it's not negative, it's zero. What about a velocity versus time graph? Well, you can't get position from a velocity versus time graph. Because remember, a velocity versus time graph is the slope of your position versus time graph. But a certain curved line would have the same slope no matter where it is, whether you raised it high, low, or wherever. It would still have the same slope. So all you can get from that is the velocity. You can read off the velocity from the velocity versus time graph, but you can't get the position. Well, you can get the, acceler the change in position, but that's something we're going to get back to later. Acceleration, again, is the slope of velocity versus time graph. And if you have an acceleration versus time graph, God forbid, then reading off the graph itself will give you the acceleration, but nothing else. Of course, the slope of that would be the jerk. Somebody would have to be a jerk to give you an acceleration versus time graph and ask you to interpret it a whole bunch of ways. Anyway, what about displacement? There are two ways to calculate an object's displacement. One each for whether the graph is an x versus t graph or a v versus t graph. So first you need to figure out what kind of graph you're dealing with. That is a very common mistake in um, all levels of physics classes. People not reading the vertical axis to figure out what the graph is graphing. So if it's a position versus time graph, that is an x versus t plot, well, to figure out the displacement, remember displacement is final minus initial, final position minus initial position. So you just read off the final value, read off the initial value, and subtract the initial value from the final value. That tells you the displacement. But remember I mentioned that even though you can't get position from a velocity versus time graph, you can get the change in position by using the fact that the area under a velocity versus time graph is the change in position. If you think about it, that kind of makes sense. Because remember how we came up with the fact that velocity is the slope of position versus time graph, and therefore v is equal to delta x over delta t? Well, we can multiply both sides by that delta t and say that, well, del delta x, the displacement, is equal to v times delta t. In other words, delta t, the base, times v, the height. Well, that only works if the velocity is constant. If the velocity is not constant, well, what would work? Well, that would be the average height. How do you figure out the average height? Well, you take the area of that rectangle and you divide by the time. Oh, well, wait a second. That, <laughs> the area of the rectangle is um, what we're looking for here. So that, that is actually the displacement. So, of course, it's easy if it's a position versus time graph. We've done this before. So calculate the displacement from 5 seconds to 25 seconds on this graph. Well, you look at the graph. You pick off the points at 5 seconds. That's the initial point. And at 25 seconds, that's the final point. And you subtract them. Delta x is x final minus x initial, which is going to be 4 meters minus 9 meters, which is negative 5 meters. That negative is really important. If the negative's not there, you're wrong and you're going to cry. So, what about a velocity versus time graph? So, yeah, you can go in reverse, but all you can do is figure out the change in position. So, yeah, you've lost the, by taking the slope to get velocity in the first place, you've lost the information about what the initial position was. But still, you can figure out a change in position by taking the area between the two different times underneath the function. And what I mean by underneath is I mean the area between the function and the time axis. If the velocity is always positive, then your area is going to be positive. But if the velocity is negative, then you're going to be taking the area still between the function and the time axis. That's going to be a negative displacement which makes sense because if the velocity is always negative, that means you're always moving to the left, which means whenever you ended, you ended at a place farther to the left than where you began. That's called a negative displacement. Okay, so let's see how this will work. Consider this graph. Find the displacement from a time of 2 seconds to 20 seconds. So here's what we do in a situation like this. Note first, we need to check what kind of graph it is. If it's a position versus time graph, then we would just read off, oh, it's at a value of 2 at 20 seconds, it's at a value of 4 at um, 2 seconds, so a displacement of negative 2 meters. Well, wait a second, we can't do that here, because this is a velocity versus time graph. So what I recommend in these cases is kind of 
mentally shade off the areas that are not relevant. In other words, we don't care about anything from that happened before two seconds or anything that happened after 20 seconds. The only thing we care about is the position, the displacement between two seconds and 20 seconds. That is the change in X, the change in position from two seconds to 20 seconds. Well, how do we do that from a velocity versus time graph? Remember, we take the area. What area? The area between the function and the time axis. And we're going to do that bit by bit. Green is going to denote positive and red is going to denote negative. So notice that the graph, the function itself crosses the time axis at 10 seconds. So that's going to be one area right there, the area of that trapezoid. And it stays negative from 10 to 15 seconds. So red is going to denote a negative area. And you'll see how that works when we actually calculate our areas and plug in, quote, heights. And then from 15 to 20 seconds, we're back to being positive. So we'll take the area of that trapezoid as well. Okay, so what is the displacement from 2 seconds to 20 seconds? Well, displacement is going to be the sum of those areas. And I'm going to call, I'm going to give names to these regions. So in other words, it's going to be area 1 plus area 2 plus area 3. And I say plus on all of those because area 2 is going to turn out to be negative, as you'll soon see. So displacement is the sum of those areas. Okay, well, what's the area of a trapezoid? Well, all a trapezoid is, remember, is it's a rectangle with one or two corners shaved off and moved somewhere else. So it's like, okay, the formula for the area of a trapezoid should be pretty similar to the area of a rectangle, except instead of base times height, it's going to be average base times height, or average height times base, depending how your trapezoid is oriented. Well, what's an average of two things that are changing at a constant rate? It's just the endpoints divided by 2, the sum of the endpoints divided by 2. So base 1 plus base 2 over 2 is the average base here. Region 2 is a triangle. Region 3 is another trapezoid. In this case, again, with two different bases but the same height. All right, what are our numbers here? Well, the base 1 for the first trapezoid was 8 seconds long, from 2 seconds to 10 seconds. Base 2 was 6 seconds long, in other words, the top base, so to speak. So there you go, 6 seconds. The height was 4 meters per second. So yeah, I mean, a height in this case has units of velocity, because after all, we're reading it off of a velocity axis. Region 2, the base is 5 seconds, but notice in this case the height is negative. The height is negative. It's negative 6 meters per second. That's what's going to give us a negative area, the fact that the height here is negative. And similarly, base 3, or sorry, region 3, again, our trapezoid, base 1 is 5 seconds, base 2 is 3 seconds. The height is 2 meters per second. So we grind all that through. First, we notice that we can cancel factors of seconds in each expression, leaving us with units of meters. And then we just work the numbers out. 28 meters minus 15 meters is... Or sorry, yeah, 28 meters minus 15 meters is 13 meters, plus another 8 meters is 21 meters. So there is the displacement from 2 seconds to 20 seconds. Does this make sense? Well, notice that, I mean, visually you can tell that this function spent more time in the positive area than in the negative area. And even though it reached a pretty strong negative value, it didn't spend long in the negative area at all. So it makes sense that our displacement here should be positive. So, if the graph is a position versus time graph, the displacement, just change in position. Just take final position minus initial position. Read the positions off the graph. But if it's a velocity versus time graph, you're going to need to deal with taking areas. And remember that if the velocity is negative, that's going to contribute a negative area. Um, whether you want to think of it as negative heights or whether you just want to subtract off absolute value of area, that's up to you. The point is that when you're checking your work, you should note that the part of your graph that was had a negative function should contribute a negative value for the displacement in that section. Now every once in a while you'll have a troll teacher like me who might give you a graph, at least on a homework problem, where it's hard to tell exactly where the line crosses the time axis. In other words, like, uh, does it actually cross at 
3.5 seconds or is that actually a little bit less than 3.5 seconds? And you might say, well, okay, you're a good algebra student and based on figuring out two points that you can definitely identify on that graph, you can then come up with the equation for that line and then from the equation for that line set y equal to zero or in this, in this case x equal to zero and solve for the time where it crosses the time axis. Well, that's hard. I mean, it's not incredibly hard, but it's it's painful, it's cumbersome. A trick in that case would actually be just to shift your time axis down to where the graph ends. But by doing so, you've introduced an extra rectangle by shifting the time axis down. But sure, yeah, you can shift your time axis down and just take the area of a triangle and then subtract out that rectangle. If you want a nice example of that, then you can take a look in the homework problems if you're one of my students. But otherwise, we are at the end of our explanation of kinematics via graphical means. In other words, using graphs to explain and make predictions about and understand the motion of an object. So if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments area. And thank you for watching.